What we're going to do this morning is um, we're going to dive in. This seems terribly self-involved, but we're actually going to look at the book of Daniel uh, in, the, in the Old Testament. And uh, it's hard enough to, to try and crack up your Bibles and, and read uh, the New Testament and some of the things uh, that Paul is writing to us. It, it's nearly impossible to do that in the Old Testament without some sort of context of kind of what's going on. Um, so before we totally jump in, two-minute kind of summary of, of sort of this stage of biblical history when this passage is being written will be in Daniel chapter 3. Um, the primary guy that we're going to be reading about in this passage, his name is King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, which I don't know a lot of Nebuchadnezzars. I guess the name has fallen out of style. Uh, maybe call him Nebi. But he's the king um, of Babylon, which is this empire that has dominated this whole part of the world at this point. And uh, right about the time, um, this is about 605 B.C., um, so there is no Christianity at this point. We're still 600 years away from Jesus the Messiah coming. So at this point, um, the Jews are, are, are God's people. Those are his covenant people um, that since the time of Abraham through Moses, through David, and all of this, this is the people who he has promised deliverance to. Um, in the midst of this, um, the Babylonian Empire has just crushed um, kind of the Holy Land, uh, you know, Israel, and specifically the city of Jerusalem. Um, Nebuchadnezzar has come in, conquered that city, burned the temple, um, ripped down the city walls, and taken the majority of those uh, Jewish people captive. So um, this is kind of, would be the equivalent of today, um, if you're a Roman Catholic, and, and the Vatican City just got, just got crushed and wiped out, uh, the Pope uh, the cathedrals and all that stuff was just was just gone. Um, kind of imagining how a Roman Catholic would feel at that point is about what Daniel and these guys are feeling like at this point, uh, kind of in biblical history. Um, Dr. Thomas Constable um, has a commentary on Daniel, and, and he put it this way. He said, To the observer of Israel's fortunes in Daniel's time, it seemed that Yahweh, God, had either become impotent or had abandoned his chosen people. The gods of Assyria and Babylon had apparently triumphed over him. His temple lay in ruins. His capital had been ravaged and stood empty and vulnerable, and his people were living as unhappy captives in a foreign land. I'm a terrible golfer. That's kind of a change of subject. Um, I've never been good at golf. I can usually pick up sports decently well. Um, I'd like to think that if I had the time, uh, the energy, and the money to really learn how to play golf, that I could get good at it, uh, but sadly, I don't have uh, really much of any of those three resources at this juncture of my life. Um, but golf's a popular sport, particularly in, in, in the business world. Uh, you know, as guys maybe want to do something outside of the office, go do something fun, be outside, and play golf together. But there's also this angle that something, there's something about playing golf with somebody, uh, which is a very frustrating game uh, where, you know, we can kind of put on whatever face we want to in any given conversation or, or, or formal setting, uh, you know. But how a guy carries himself when they're playing golf is probably a little more indicative maybe of, you know, what he's really like or at least how he responds to conflict, which is important stuff to know. Um, another way to kind of express that principle is, um, you know, if you really want to see what a man's made of, um, when stuff's not going right, when everything's going wrong and hitting the fan, um, how does he respond? How does he react in the midst of a crisis or in the midst of a tragedy? Um, what we're going to look at when we jump in now uh, to Daniel chapter 3 um, is how three men, three Jews in the midst of this Babylonian empire um, how they respond um, in a heck of a pinch. They're in a, a tough situation that we read about in this chapter. Um, and basically the, the theme, the main question we're going to be asking this morning is, how do you respond when the heat is on? Okay, and that'll make more sense after we read the passage, but figuratively speaking, when the heat's on, when it's going down, you know, how do you respond? Um, so turn with me, if you would, if you haven't already, uh, to Daniel chapter 3. And we'll take it from the top, verse 1. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide. Um, so that's 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. So it's like 9 basketball goals 
stack to this huge thing, right? Um, builds it and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. Um, all right, so verse 2, in, in our language, basically that's, uh, you know, that's the presidential cabinet, the secretary of you name it. Uh, that's the highest ranking military offer, uh, officers, uh, the Supreme Court justices. Uh, I'm sure LeBron James would have been on the scene too. Just a kind of a who's who in the Babylonian Empire is here for the dedication of this huge statue. Um, in verse 3, um, it relists all those names. It says they all assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Okay, verse 4. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and people of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. And that closes verse 6. Uh, and that's not this figurative language, metaphorical, like, oh, you're going to burn one day for that. It's like literally there's a smoking cauldron on the property, and if you don't bow down, they're going to toss you into it. Um, so literally, lives are at stake. So it seems like in, if you're in this situation, it's a fairly, fairly easy decision-making process. I don't want to get thrown into a burning furnace, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of you know, play along with this. Um, but not that easy, really, for, for these three Jewish guys that we're going to read about. Um, and here's why. At this point, like I said, uh, there is no Christianity. There is no Jesus. There is no, uh, you know, by God's grace, thankfully, today, uh, it's not up to us to follow perfectly his law in order to maintain our standing before him. Um, we sing about that all the time. Jesus has paid it all. And the only way we can have a relationship with God uh, is through Jesus and his death on the cross. Because um, heaven knows I mess up daily, you know. Uh, but at this time, the Messiah has not come. Uh, and explicitly, if you look at the Ten Commandments, and, and specifically in Exodus 20, you don't have to turn there, but Exodus 20, verses 3 and 4, literally says, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything else. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. You get the picture. It's like there's this literally identical illustration of what they're very clearly commanded not to do um, from Yahweh, from God. Um, so doing so would be a huge violation um, for them. So, so these guys are in this pickle, um, and they're having to ask themselves, I'm sure they're looking at themselves, uh, you know, what should we do? How should we respond? You know, is there any way we can kind of justify making an excuse just this once so that we can keep on living? I'm sure all this stuff, um, if we were in that situation, uh, would all be flying through our heads. Um, to summarize verses, um, if we picked up verses 7 through 12, um, just to kind of summarize it, basically these three Babylonian guys go up to the king and they say, yeah, you know, I don't want to say anything, but these three guys, you know, they, 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 the music ceremony goes, they play the instruments, everybody bows, and these Babylonians come over and they say, uh, you know, there was three guys over there, I saw them, I think they were Jews, uh, they didn't bow when you said it, uh, in verse 12, you know, they neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. So basically, these guys don't do it. So we find out what decision they made. They don't bow. They get ratted on. All right. And then the action picks up in verse 13, uh, where we can read together. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those are the three Jewish guys. I'm sure I'm butchering at least one of their names. Um, so these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Okay? So he's asking them. And then verse 15, Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? So it kind of just reemphasizes what was said earlier in verse 4 or 5. Um, 
But basically what we're seeing there in that little series is they're getting a second chance, okay, which I, I wouldn't have necessarily expected. I would have expected it would be immediate, throw them in the furnace. But he's giving them a chance, putting them on the spot. You can still change your mind. It's not too late, all right? So in situations like this, um, no, no crime, really. Going back to um, a quote from Charles Feinberg, which I read, uh, which I like a lot. It says, in situations like this, no crime is greater than nonconformity. Yet that is exactly what God asks of us when things of the world are set against things of God. I'll say that again. No, gr- no crime seems like it is like nothing is worse than nonconformity. Right? The worst thing you could do is not conform, except when things of the world are set against things of God. It says it very clearly. Um, so going back to that question, how do you respond when the heat is on? Right? The first thing we see from these guys, stand your ground. Right? That's the first response. Uh, don't get bullied around. Don't get talked into it. Don't become just a chameleon and blend in with your, you know, whatever your culture is and says is okay. Uh, just because the culture says it's okay doesn't change what the Word of God says. Okay, so the first response when the heat is on is to stand your ground. Okay, we see they get a second chance. Um, you know, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar is saying, I know that you don't buy it, but I'm at least going to give you, you know, go through the motions and we're cool. So here we go. 16 through 18 this is the best part. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this manner. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and it will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Okay, so each one of those three verses is huge. In verse 16, basically they say, listen, man, like, we don't have anything to prove to you. Like, I think their exact, what they said was, we don't need to defend ourselves before you. Like, this is what we believe, this is our values, and this is who we are, and this is what we're going to do. And then verse 17, I love the way they put this. It says, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is, what's that word? Able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from it. And those are kind of two different things, right? Um, and that's just kind of a reality is, is that God is all-powerful. He is constantly able to do more than you can imagine. Um, it doesn't mean that it is necessarily in his will in that given situation, which is hard. One of the hardest parts of being a believer is kind of understanding, uh, you know, when bad things are happening, when stuff's going down, where is God? Um, I remember uh, my dad got sick a couple years ago with, with kind of a rare blood cancer. It's called lymphoma. Um, and I'm sure if I look back at my prayers during that period, almost everything, um, I would, you know, almost every prayer would have to do with, you know, asking him to, to heal my dad, that my dad would be okay, um, which is easy to do, right? That's the natural response is if someone you love is struggling or sick, you want to see them healed, you want to see them get better, and that's great. Like, we're supposed to do that. Uh, what's really hard and really difficult would have been to pray this prayer. God, I, I, know, that, I know that you're able to heal my dad. You are all powerful. Um, and I believe you're able to heal him. Um, and I pray that I pray that you would, you know. I hope that you will. But even if you don't, like, I trust that you're good. And I trust that even in the midst of a tragedy and even in the midst of a great loss and conflict, um, that you're God and you're good. Uh, and that's an incredibly difficult place to be. But that's exactly what we see in verse 18. When in verse 17, they say, we believe God can deliver us. He is able. I think he's willing. And then 18 says, even if he's not, though, like, we're not going to abandon our faith. Um, And don't miss this. Basically, they're saying, our obedience is not dependent on a specific result. Like, my faith in God is not dependent just on, you know, what I'm getting out of the deal. Um, You know, for better or worse, in tragedy or triumph, he is God, I am not, and I can trust in his sovereignty. Um, And that's what we see. Even with the furnace blazing, right, literally, um, these guys say, we trust that God is in control. So that's the second response. Uh, When the heat is on, the first response, stand your ground. 
right? The second response, trust in God's sovereignty, right? He is God and we're not. Um, moving on, right, verses 19 through 23, which kind of makes up um, the last of, of the key sections. I'll, I'll summarize it. Um, basically, um, Nebuchadnezzar freaks out, throws him in the fire, demands that it gets heated up seven times hotter than it normally is. Um, the guards that go throw them in actually get burned, and, and it's kind of a done deal. They're in there. I'm sure he's huffing and puffing, is still angry. Uh, and then all of a sudden, um, if we look at verse 24, okay, verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Um, we're not going to even get into the fourth guy, who is it, what does it mean, because that's like an entire different sermon. Um, but the point is, they're walking around in there, and, and they don't seem to be dying. They're not screaming. Verse 26, Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Okay, so God decides in this situation to deliver them. Um, he has blessed their faith, uh, and they lived, and it's a complete miracle because they were in a fire, obviously. All right, so then getting to verse 28. This is one of the coolest parts. Is let's, let's see how Nebuchadnezzar reacts now. Verse 28, then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces, blah, blah, blah. So you kind of see that he, maybe he misses the true character of God because now he still wants to cut people up and kill them and stuff. But the point is, his allegiance. I mean, this is the same guy um, who was making them worship this big fake idol at the beginning of the passage and at the end he is saying praise be to the god of these men and that's our god guys that's the god we're singing to this morning you know yahweh who um has you know delivered us time and time again has given us his son uh that we can have salvation in him um just what a turn like what a character arc um and why was that able to happen um because these guys showed such great faith and were willing to risk everything in the name of their god right they set the stage and God delivers, right? And he changed this guy's heart in this given situation. Um, a good way to put this is sometimes our darkest hour, sometimes our darkest hour can be God's finest moment, right? Paul says it another way in 2 Corinthians. When I am weak, he is made strong, right? When we are vulnerable, when we are weak, when we are helpless, right? We are setting the stage for him to wow us, right? And put his glory on display. So the third, the third and final response, right? Uh, how do you respond when the heat is on? You stand your ground, you trust in God's sovereignty, and then you submit yourself to his service. And just let God be God. You know, triumph or tragedy, he is good. Um, so, crazy story, obviously. Um, hard to imagine, um, kind of happening today. Um, but before we kind of just write this off as an ancient story, here's, um, here's some statistics I want to read you, and then we're about finished. So American people were polled. Um, so right now there's still four living generations of Americans, okay? Um, they have clever little names for them. There's builders, boomers, busters, and bridgers going from oldest to youngest. They polled all of these different generations and they said, um, do you believe that the Bible is the authoritative word of God? Which is basically a fancy way to say, um, like, do you believe the Bible is true and um, do you think you should obey it? You know, um, 
This is what they found out. The builders, okay? The builders are people who are currently 80 years and older. Um, 65% said, yeah, so two-thirds of people, um, easily the majority of people from that generation um, believed in the Bible, would consider themselves Christians, all that. Boomers, okay, baby boomers, um, 50 through 79, uh, 35%. Okay, so right there you went from about two-thirds to one-third in just a generation. The busters, who are currently 30 to 49, 15%. Okay, so once again, it's cut in half. All right, and last but not least, the bridgers, okay, which is this generation of kids, adolescents, young adults, um, 29 and under, basically. Um, You see 4% that say that it is the authoritative word of God. Um, This is God's truth. It is entirely true. I believe it, and I at least try to follow it. I at least feel like I should follow it. Um, One in 25 young people, basically. Um, so it's not quite the same situation as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but, but that picture of just kind of, uh, you know, in the sea of culture and, and what's normal with this Babylonian empire, you know, they were very much in the, they were in that 4% or whatever it would be. Um, they stayed strong, and they were able to change uh, a lot of stuff, at least in this particular scene. So, um, it is kind of shocking, though, that in the same, area, uh, the same era where we do have North Koreans right now, like this week, uh, being executed in prison camps for owning Bibles. Um, here in America, we're, we're kind of pushing God out of our culture, right? Uh, and not because uh, it threatens our lives, but because it threatens, threatens our comfort, basically. Um, stand your ground. Trust in God's sovereignty. Right? Submit yourself to his service. We'll close with this verse. Um, It's from Romans chapter 12. I think they're going to project it uh, so you don't have to flip there if you don't want to, but we'll close Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, perfect will. If things would have gone south uh, for these three men that we read about in Daniel 3, um, they would have quite literally been a living sacrifice. Um, But there's no greater living sacrifice than um, the flawless son of God, right? The son of man um, who God sent Um, who was fully God and fully man in the person of Jesus, right? who we read in Mark 10, did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for the many. Um, As Jesus broke bread with his disciples uh, one last time, the night he was betrayed, uh, the heat was on in a big, big way, and he knew what was coming the next day. Uh, The only reason you and I are here this morning, the only reason that we can approach him and worship him today Um, is because Jesus stood his ground. He trusted his Father, uh, and he submitted himself, even even when it meant death on a cross. Uh, When the heat was on, he delivered us. Um, We're going to approach the table for communion during this next song. Um, Before we do that, let's just take a minute of just individual prayer um, to just kind of reflect on that truth um, and Jesus' um, delivering us when the he was on, and he didn't have to do what he did, but he did it because he loves us. Uh, so take a minute in prayer, um, and we'll close um, here with, with another song and take communion um, together. Go ahead. <laughs>